Do you remember this press conference? It created a bit of a controversy, let's say. In January, it's a, a, a little tournament in Africa. A little tournament? This comment on the Africa Cup of Nations wasn't exactly well received by some Africans. A Nigerian journalist asked for an apology. I wasn't the only one that saw it, you know, that took that as an insult. It went all over Africa. The debate went on. Was Europe belittling African football? It's ironic. There's still a tournament, a big one. We lose our best players to, 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 to the African Cup. Be that as it may, African football matters. Liverpool manager Jurgen Klopp isn't the only one who knows that. But wait a minute, why do we even use the term African football? Is there a European football? A South American one? An Asian one? No. So let's not paint it all with the same brush. Let's rather look at how beautifully diverse African football is. And... What differentiates the various forms of African football, who dominates it and why? 37 players from the Premier League were called up for the AFCON 2021. Mo Salah, Sadio Mane, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang and Riyad Mahrez, to name just a few. When it comes to these players' origins, almost all hail from North and West Africa. A few players buck the trend, like Aston Villa's marvelous Nakamba from Zimbabwe. The North and the West's dominance is not a new thing. Take the teams with the most Africa Cup victories from the past. Egypt, seven times. Cameroon, five times. Ghana, four times. And Nigeria, three times. If we look at African club football, it has even only been an Arab affair lately. Al Ahli from Egypt, Espérance Tunis from Tunisia, and Widat Casablanca from Morocco have won the last five African Champions League titles. Why is that? And is there no hope for the East and the South? By the way, it's not me dividing up African football, the Africans did that. The Confederation of African Football is the overarching structure. However, unlike in Europe or South America, there are five regional subdivisions too. South, East, Central and the dominant federations of West and North Africa. So why do West and North Africa dominate? West Africans are naturally stronger. West Africans are naturally uh, made to compete very well in football. True, Liberia's George Weah, or Ivorian's Didier Drogba and Yaya Touré, they are strong guys. But then why are Italy European champions and not the Netherlands? And how would this explain the strength of North Africa and 2019 AFCON winners Algeria? One argument is, North Africans have lighter frames but compensate for this with superior ball skills. Oui et non, parce que c'est un peu simpliste, un peu généraliste, si on veut. On généralise un peu trop. In fact, just as there is no one football in Africa, there is also no one football in North and West Africa. Euh, si on prend le, le football marocain et algérien, il est assez proche. Le numéro 10 est toujours sacré au Maroc et, et en Algérie. Donc ce sont toujours des joueurs très techniques, peut-être pas forcément assez bons tactiquement ou physiquement, mais qui compensent par la technicité. Et quand on parle de, de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, euh, ce n'est pas vraiment homogène. Par exemple, je peux penser à la Guinée, par exemple, qui a, qui a des joueurs très rapides. Mais quand on compare, par exemple, la Guinée à la Côte d'Ivoire, qui sont des pays... Euh, voisin ou, ou presque voisin, ce n'est pas du tout la, la même aptitude physique. En Côte d'Ivoire, c'est beaucoup plus costaud. So, easy explanations apparently don't do the job. Maybe there are other reasons. Does culture play a role? Let's ask in Cameroon. Comme dans des pays tels que le Brésil, on apprend à jouer très jeune, on joue très tôt au football. Étant donné que c'est un sport qui est facile à pratiquer, ça ne demande pas de moyens. Il faut un ballon, il faut deux poteaux, et puis on se met à jouer. The most successful African nation at the Olympics with over a hundred medals won. Its national team never played at the World Cup and has missed more Afghans than it actually played. Kenyan footballers at top clubs? Hang on, Victor Vanyama was at Tottenham between 2016 and 2020. He's an exception to the rule though. What is Kenya's and East Africa's problem? 
Kenyan Dennis Oliech, who spent 10 years playing in France, says it has nothing to do with physique or similar, it's lack of exposure. East Africa is a virgin field for scouts and there is a lot of untapped talent. But why the lack of exposure? What makes countries in Eastern Africa different? Historically, la plupart des pays ont été colonisés par la Grande-Bretagne. Des sports comme le cricket ou le rugby ont dû batailler avec le foot. Donc, le football a très souvent été en concurrence avec d'autres sports. Ce qui n'a pas toujours été le cas en Afrique, en Afrique de l'Ouest, notamment au Cameroun, où le football est le sport roi. So, are the varying levels of quality in African football also related to the colonial legacy? Listen up! Time for history class. On the beat, Minecraft. French clubs started to recruit players from Morocco and Algeria as early as the 30s. Both countries were then under French rule. They also established transfer networks from the 50s onwards with West Africa. Portuguese clubs started recruiting from their colonies from 1949. And clubs in Belgium from what is today called DR Congo since the 1960s. And what about Britain? It didn't let players from its colonies in. A two-year residency qualification for non-British players meant foreigners could de facto only be amateurs. This rule lasted until 1978. History class over. Well, um, kind of. Hold it now! So, Britain didn't bring East African players in. But why were former British West African colonies Nigeria and Ghana so successful then? Well, after independence, Nigeria was economically relatively stable. Its league was strong. Nigeria's national team won its first AFCON in 1980. We used to have a, a black and white TV then. And when, whenever we don't have power supply, my dad would come with um, the car battery to generate power for the TV. I grew up seeing all that, the fans, the passion to watch our local players play in the league. A league that used to be a, a big deal back in the day. The stadiums were filled up. League matches were reported daily on television, in the newspapers. Nigerian football developed and the world slowly took notice. Nigerian players such as Stephen Keshi became pioneers when moving to Europe. Imagine a player like that coming out of Nigeria. He inspired the others to also want to move to Europe. And that also was the beginning of the growth and the production of talent out of Nigeria, for example. And you know what it is when someone comes out of a community and does well in a particular field. You have other youngsters who want to emulate that person. Many youngsters from Africa have done so since, inspired by their role models and seeking economic stability. Today, there are 46 Africans playing in the Premier League compared to only 17 South Americans. The overwhelming majority is from West Africa. But then again, it's not just history and structure. Some say it's also about mentality. The average Nigerian is much more ambitious than the average Kenyan. This is no disrespect to the Kenyans. That is the makeup of the Nigerian. We are dreamers, we are ambitious. We want to succeed. This might sound a bit harsh, but just listen to what Eastern Africans say about this themselves. West Africans are famously known for their Billy No Mates mentality. They have a unique fighting approach in all walks of life, says Kenyan analyst Kochecha S. Kochecha. And the Eastern African minds, on the contrary, are engulfed by the fear of failure, lack of courage and timidness. Belgian anthropologist Noel B. Salazar quotes Tanzanians he interviewed, Migration is not a very Tanzanian thing to do. They are not the most ambitious people and they have a family to rely on. So this issue, besides being historical and structural, seems to indeed be psychological as well. But there are exceptions to this rule, like Mbavana Samata, a Tanzanian who made it to Premier League. Plus, his compatriots do not have to go that far. Historiquement, les 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 pays de l'Afrique du Nord étaient beaucoup plus de l'Europe, donc ils ont bénéficié d'une infrastructure et d'une proximité qui était géographique et historique. Donc, il y a eu, si si vous voulez, une institutionnalisation du du football qui était beaucoup plus ancienne. As mentioned, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia have historical ties with France. 
In Egypt, football started to grow under the British occupation force. Egypt joined FIFA as the first African nation in 1923. It was also the first African country to play at a World Cup in 1934. Today, its league is going from strength to strength. And the passion is unreal. This is Al Ahli fans while their team are just training. And it's not just Egypt. Northern African League set the standard for the rest of the continent. The clubs sont gérés comme comme des sociétés. Les enjeux financiers ont, ont surtout explosé. Moi, je pense par exemple à l'Égypte où les les groupes médias privés sont sont prêts à à mettre des des millions et des millions de dollars, ce qui permet de retenir beaucoup plus les joueurs et de retenir les stars du continent qui viennent jouer en Afrique du Nord. But when you look at the the um, um, the Northern Africans, it's still like that. Their leagues are still top notch. And um, when you compare the league with the European standard, yeah, there is no much of a difference in it. The pay is fine. The administrative part of it is going well. And this strength of North African clubs also translates into good results for their national teams. South African Premier Division is well run. Mamelodi Sundowns from Pretoria and Orlando Pirates from Johannesburg have both won the African Champions League. Another Johannesburg side, the Kaiser Chiefs, have a huge following and are the second richest club in Africa after Al Ahli. But. The revers de la médaille, c'est uh, l'équipe nationale. Uh, and for me, très sincèrement, je ne comprends pas qu'il y ait autant de moyens misés sur le championnat et qu'il n'y ait pas autant de moyens misés sur l'équipe nationale. Je ne trouve toujours pas le, le, la raison exacte pour laquelle le, le, la sélection de l'Afrique du Sud ne joue plus de Coupe du Monde. Well, if the experts are short on explanations, what do you expect from me then? South Africa did not even qualify for the AFCON 2021. Plus, they're out of the World Cup in Qatar 2022. Central Africa, you ask? It's a similar story with former powerhouse DR Congo. In 1974, then as a year, they played at the World Cup. Around that time, they also won two AFCON titles. Today, this huge country of over 90 million people failed to qualify for AFCON 2021. There are always fresh faces emerging in African football. Take Comoros, who sensationally qualified for the Africa Cup of Nations 2021. They are African football's latest fairy tale story. Population? 850,000. The Iceland of Africa? Not sure, but it shows one thing. In Africa, the les moyens se sont démocratisés, le football s'est démocratisé et, et ce n'est plus réservé à une certaine classe. La vérité du terrain, elle est absolue et, et c'est cette démocratie-là qui est la seule vraie démocratie de l'Afrique en fait. C'est les 11 contre les 11 euh, qui arrivent sur le terrain et c'est la meilleure histoire de, du football africain et on l'aime comme ça. Donc, Uh, on veut surtout pas que ça change, on veut que ça reste comme ça, c'est sans charme. Là c'est imbattable, je peux plus. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, 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 a,